Hi, I'm John the Engineer, and this being the 50th anniversary of the assassination of JFK, I decided I was going to give my take on it. I've been watching this seriously, read all the books, watched all the videos, caught as many anomalies and discrepancies as I could, and I watched a video by Vincent Bugliosi, Bugliosi who had won the case and proved that Oswald acted alone in a mock trial in London, England uh, against Jerry Spence. So he came on and did a video recently, he published a book, and uh, where he basically says Oswald acted alone. Well, I don't believe so. And he's going to keep referring to lay people who don't know and can be easily fooled by the conspiracy theorists. And I want to point out, I'm not your average layperson, okay? I got a degree in systems engineering, and in my last year, I took the mathematics of gambling course, became the teaching assistant for four more years, got known as the great Canadian gambler of those you people who've seen Rounders, the poker uh, video on about the Taj Mahal poker room. I was known as the professor at the Taj Mahal. So, given my experience in the mathematics of gambling and systems engineering, you might say I'm the closest thing to Mr. Spock on this planet. And I scored 100% in university physics, A plus in fourth year electronics engineering. And if anybody isn't going to be fooled by non-scientific inconsistencies and anomalies, it's John, the great Canadian gambler. So, I'm willing to bet that every time I say it's probable, it is the most probable reason that something happened. And I'm going to go through a lot of inconsistencies I'm always willing to bet on. So on this anniversary of JFK's assassination, one of the greatest presidents in U.S. history, I decided to spend a lot of time and tear apart Vincent Bugliosi's indictment of Lee Harvey Oswald who I actually think that Harvey was a hero, okay? Whiz kid, fake defector to the Soviet Union, got in and out, you know, was an FBI informant doing what Kennedy wanted, shutting down the CIA, get the, you know, Cuban Castro people. So um, this is a different story than we're told. And uh, I hope that through this uh, in, indictment of Lee that I'm going to shoot down, I can get most of the facts and anomalies I'm aware of out to you. It's long. Okay, so I'm going to read the article Lee Harvey Oswald from Wikipedia. Now, I don't advocate Wikipedia as the authority on anything. My page is a mess full of wrong innuendos, and when I tried to correct them, someone put them back to innuendos. So, no way you can count on this, but this is the official version that's out there, so I'm going to use it as the base. Lee Harvey Oswald, October 1839 to November 24th, 63, was, according to five government investigations, the sniper who assassinated John F. Kennedy, the 35th president of the United States in Dallas, Texas, on November 22nd, 1963. Oswald was a former Marine who defected to the Soviet Union in October 1959. He lived in the Soviet Union until June 62. Now remember, this was the time just before the U-2 flight over Russia came down and scuttled the peace talks between Khrushchev and Eisenhower. And also during the Bay of Pigs time. So here was an American living in Russia during those times. At which time he returned to the United States. Oswald was initially arrested for the murder of police officer J.G. Tippett who was uh, killed on a Dallas street approximately 45 minutes after Kennedy was shot. Oswald would later be charged with the assassination of President Kennedy as well, but denied involvement in either of the killings. Two days later, while being transferred from police headquarters to the county jail, Oswald was shot and killed by Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby in full view of television cameras broadcasting live. They couldn't say CIA, mafia, connected FBI informant, nightclub owner. In 1964, the Warren Committee concluded that Oswald acted alone in assassinating Kennedy, firing three shots. One shot apparently missed the limousine entirely. Another struck Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly uh, a second later. 
and another struck Kennedy in the head. This conclusion was supported by prior investigations carried out by the FBI, Secret Service, and Dallas Police Department, and we know how efficient and handy they are with the evidence. Despite forensic, ballistic, and eyewitness evidence supporting the lone gunman theory, public opinion polls taken over the years have shown a majority of Americans believe that Oswald did not act alone, but conspired with others to kill the president, and some believe that he didn't conspire with anybody to kill the president, that he might have tried to save him. And the assassination has spawned numerous conspiracy theories. In 1979, the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded Oswald fired the shots, but differed from previous investigations in concluding that scientific acoustical evidence establishes a high probability that two gunmen fired at President John F. Kennedy. The House Select Committee's acoustical evidence has since been discredited. Probably not. So, quickly, his childhood, his father died when he was very young. And uh, he lived with his mother and his other brothers for a little while. Went to grade six, I believe, in Fort Worth. Uh, by the time he got into high school, they moved to New York, where he was a truant for a while, but a heavy reader, but a bad speller. And uh, had a vivid fantasy life. They thought he was schizoid, aggressive, passive type diagnosis by a shrink. But eventually he straightened out and then he came back to Texas and finished his grade 8 and grade 9 was in grade 10 when he quit and joined the army, the Marines. And then he passed and he became an uh, expert in radar operation and he was sent off to Atsugi in Japan, the top secret U-2 flights over the Soviet Union. He was part of that. <clears throat> and then when he came back, he was assigned to teach people Officers and enlisted men, give them courses. 20-year-old whiz kid. Wow. So anyway, then he got a discharge, I, I believe, in, six, in 59. And what's an interesting story is that he uh, got his papers. His, <clears throat> within nine days after his discharge, he managed to get his passport. He managed to apply to foreign universities and get answers so he could get visas, so he could be in Europe nine days later. Gee, whiz kid at red tape too, right? To then end up in the Soviet Union. And then when they weren't going to let him stay, he did a little gash on his arm to try and scare them, and then they let him stay. And then he stuck around, worked in a boring job for a little while, did okay, was well-liked, and uh, but eventually got married, wanted to come back, found it kind of boring, nowhere to spend his money. And so the U.S. government gave this guy, who was a U-2 uh, informer with the Soviet Union, just as they got down the U-2 flight that everybody thinks they might have shot down, and give him money to come back home. So anyway, he gets back to, to the States, and he's immediately taken in by anti-Russian people in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area who sympathize with Marina, the daughter of a KGB colonel, you know, and they find him arrogant. 23-year-old arrogant kid? Come on. Anyway, he ends up shuffling through the, all these jobs, you know, but gets down to New Orleans for a while, where he ends up being involved in anti-Castro stuff with David Ferry and Guy Bannister. And you can see him being sheep-dipped, like he's approaching anti-Castro people and pro-Castro people and, you know, being caught on both sides. And uh, But he seems to have been an infiltrator for the FBI, this whiz kid, because uh, Bowden, one of the Secret Service agents, the first black man ever put on Secret Service for the president, uh, said that the Chicago office uh, thwarted an assassination attempt due to a tip from an FBI informant named Lee. And Lee told his girlfriend, Judith Baker, who had been working with him and David Ferry on coming up with cancer to give to Castro and try and kill him. And uh, she said that he even said he claimed he had saved the president's life once. Must have been the right lead. And here he was now infiltrating all these guys, Ferry and Bannister and anti-Castro people, and there's a hit that's going to go on. And at the time, don't forget, after the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy promised Khrushchev he was going to stop all these CIA operations against Cuba. So he sent in the FBI to shut them down, and that's why they were pretty mad at that, too. And there's a really good chance that 
Lee Harvey was the informant for the FBI because he was seen at these camps just before they were busted by the FBI. So, and of course, when he was uh, arrested in uh, New Orleans and taken in because he'd been scuffling with some anti Castro people as he was passing out the pro Castro stuff this time, and they didn't like him playing both sides. And uh, FBI came down to see him and spoke to him for an hour of debriefing of their top FBI agent infiltrating the anti-Castro people. So anyway, that's basically where it ends up before now we have the assassination that's going to happen by these people on Kennedy. And what's he going to do about it? Well, anyway, uh, he might have tried to do something, but I certainly don't think he participated in it, having said that he liked Kennedy that much. So we're going to basically follow the indictment of Vincent Bugliosi, of the whiz kid, cold warrior, turned into peace warrior, I guess you'd say, because if he approved Kennedy shutting down the CIA guys, he was ready to make peace, wasn't he? So... Let's see if I can answer the accusations raised by a prosecutor who is going to be an expert at producing every half-truth and nothing but the half-truth on every issue and trying to bury every mitigating circumstance that he's going to call a conspiracy theory. So here we go. Why Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in the assassination of JFK. Proof from attorney Vincent Bugliosi. Reclaiming History, the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy is a book by attorney Vincent Bugliosi that analyzes the events surrounding the assassination of John F. Kennedy, focusing on the lives of Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. The book is drawn from many sources, including the Warren Report, his 1,632-page, million-point-five-word book, analyzes all aspects of the assassination and the rise of the conspiracy theories about Kennedy's assassination in the years subsequent to the event. Bugliosi argues that the Warren Commission is right about Lee Oswald acting alone in shooting Kennedy. The book won the 2008 Edgar Award for Best Fact Crime. Much of the book was based on Bugliosi's preparation for a mock trial of Lee Harvey Oswald staged by British television, in which he acted as the prosecutor of Oswald and obtained a verdict of guilty. My professional interest in the Kennedy assassination date back to March 86, when I was approached by a British production company to, to prosecute Lee Harvey Oswald as the alleged assassin in a proposed 21-hour television trial to be shown in England and several other countries, including the United States. I immediately had misgivings. Up to then, I consistently turned down offers to appear on television in artificial courtroom settings. But when I heard more of what was contemplating, my misgivings quickly dissolved. All of this could not be the real trial of Oswald. LWT, working with a large budget, had conceived and was putting together the closest thing to a real trial of Oswald that there would likely ever be. The trial in London being the only prosecution of Oswald ever conducted with the real witnesses in the Kennedy assassination who are left. Though painstakingly and dogged effort, LWT had managed to locate and persuade most of these original key lay witnesses, many of whom had refused to even talk to the media for years to testify. There would be absolutely no script and no actors would be used. In 2007, Bugliosi told Cynthia McFadden of ABC News that in the preceding seven years, he devoted 80 to 100 hours per week working on the book. In 2009, an interview with Pat Morrison, he described reclaiming history as his magnum opus and said it was the work he was most proud of. Comparing its sales with his 71 bestseller, Helter Skelter, he told Morrison, if you want to make money, you don't put out a book that weighs seven and a half pounds and costs 57 and has over 10,000 citations and a million and a half words. And don't forget, lawyers believe that the bigger the documentation, the better the case. The book is divided into several major parts, including a detailed chronology of the events of the assassination, as well as an exploration of the major conspiracy theories. Oh yeah, I'm sure he covers them in good depth. A chapter on the trial of Jack Ruby, and a chapter featuring his interviews with Marina Oswald. He also provides a partial list of assassins 
whom one or more conspiracy theorists have actually named and identified as having fired a weapon at Kennedy. I wonder if you'll name the ones that are most logical. This list includes 82 separate names. Well, I guess he came up with a lot of funny ones. In a review of the New York Times, Brian Burrow wrote, Bulliozzi is refreshing because he doesn't just pick apart the conspiracy theorists. He ridicules them and by name, writing that most of them are as kooky as a $3 bill. Oh, wow. That really, really does tear into our and questions about the anomalies, doesn't it? New York Times, you know, only telling you what's good for you, they say. Alex Kingsbury of U.S. News and World Report described it as the most exhaust is of the countless narratives that have been written about the fateful day, according to Steve Donahue of Open Letters Monthly, Reclaiming History, in addition being the longest book ever written on the subject, is also the most enjoyable of them all to read. Yeah, pin the blame on the little guy. Tim Shetman of the Telegraph said Mr. Bulliozzi has turned up no new killer fact. His technique is to expose the double think and distortions of the conspiracy theorists. So he's an expert on what didn't happen. The book has received criticism from conspiracy advocates and theorists, and there'll be a bunch of it now. Reviewing the book for Salah, David Talbot charged that the skin-deep nature of his research is striking and that he's guilty of cooking the facts to make his case. James Fetzer contended that Bugliosi's misled his readers by lies, omissions, and deliberate distortions, where in particular, when confronted with evidence that's incompatible with his own official but fanciful theory, he either twists, warps, or distorts the evidence or simply ignores it. His key claims are not merely provably false, but in crucial cases, not even physically possible. And I hope to show a lot of that over this coming little time. The book he's going to talk to you about tonight, his new book, I will promise you is going to be his biggest book of all time. Because 1,600 pages, plus more pages for exhibits, and, I, and Mr. Bugliosi knows this. Lots of exhibits, will yeah. let you write anything nearly that long. We are honored and privileged to have Mr. Remember the Warren Commission with their interviewing the cook of someone for three hours that wasn't even important to the case? I mean, silly witnesses that they packed into their millions of questions and stuff. Same kind of stuff. You know, I'm not impressed by volume. I'm impressed by quality, right? Mr. Vincent Bugliosi here to address it. <laughs> Number one, I learned that um, the very things that the conspiracy theorists were accusing the Warren Commission of, i.e. suppressing the evidence, distorting the evidence, it was they who were guilty of these precise things. The we second thing I learned is that these conspiracy theories of theirs, um, at first blush, some of them may be intellectually palatable, but they did not withstand scrutiny, and uh, I just determined Name that there was just no substance to all these charges. And yet, the vast majority of Americans, even today, believe in a conspiracy theory. That's right. They have rejected the findings of the Warren Commission. So it was at that point right. that I decided to write a book, way back in 1986. And I started in 1986, finally finished. It's difficult for me to speak candidly about reclaiming history. The problem I have here in speaking candidly about reclaiming history is that if I'm candid, <clears throat> it sounds like I'm very immodest, <laughs> which is not good. So tonight, I'm going to sound a little bit like I'm boasting here and there, but the alternative is... Me too. You know, this is just another book. It's not just another book, for all types of reasons. Yeah, piece of trash. Very briefly... Reclaiming History is the first book, this is not a boast, the first book on the assassination ever to cover the entire case. No book has ever even attempted to cover the entire I bet she misses a assassination. lot. Uh, I've got stuff in the book, uh, relevant stuff, that's not even in the Warren Report or the House Select Committee. And lots of irrelevant stuff, too. Secondly, it had always been the conventional, wis uh, conventional wisdom that there would never, even by people like myself, who believe that Oswald killed Kennedy and acted alone, it had always been the conventional wisdom that there would never be a satisfactory resolution to this case, that there would always be some doubt. I believe, and many people
people who read the book believe that? Well, as long as they keep withholding files, how can there not be some doubt? How can a guy like him, who hasn't seen all the files, be expressing no doubt? Zero doubt. You get it? At, uh, reclaiming History settles all the questions about the Kennedy assassination <laughs> once and for all. The LA Times Review. They said so. Says, with Reclaiming History, oh. from this point forward, no reasonable person, let's underline the word reasonable, no That's reasonable right. person That's can right. argue right. that Lee Harvey Oswald was innocent, no sane person can take seriously assertions that Kennedy was killed by the CIA, Castro, the mob, the Soviets, Texas oil men, or his vice president, Lyndon Johnson. Each may be guilty of crime. Okay, at least drop Castro. Okay, but everybody else sounded pretty good. <laughs> but none had anything to do with Kennedy's assassination. Reclaiming history may finally move those accusations beyond civilized debate. The third thing about uh, Reclaiming History, it's the first book, surprisingly, uh, ever to take on all of these... Quit telling us what it's going to do and do it! Jeez! Conspiracy theorists and destroy their theories. There's been yeah. a lot book that's done that. There's been books that have taken right. on a couple of the theories, but this takes on every one of the theories, and I think I'm successful in, in, uh, in destroying those We'll, we'll find those out, theories. won't we? My editor... And so, New Starling Lawrence said it took a book of this magnitude oh, to finally put a stake in the heart of the conspiracy movement in this country. There's also over 10,000 citations. I think it's the most um, sourced, uh, well certainly it's the most sourced uh, Kennedy assassination book ever. And someone said it may be the most sourced non-fiction book ever with over 10,000 citations. If there's one thing about me of things that make Oswald look guilty, but none of the things that don't. That I take pride in, I never, ever, ever make a charge without supporting it. You may not agree with me, but I just don't make a charge and just, just, just go on. I'll we'll often we'll see you soon, I hope. A very assertive, declarative uh, caption, and then you search in vain in the article for the proof, and either you find nothing at all, or something very anemic. That's not my style. Oh. If I say something, I support it. Well, you may not agree with me, but I going. also support And that's those over 10,000 citations. Oh, get going. Why is this book oh. so long? Who cares? My editor, at its core, this is a very, very simple case. Very simple. Chief Justice Earl Warren used to be the DA of Oakland County, and he said that uh, if when he was DA, this would have been a two or three day murder case. And I agree with him. Within hours of the shooting here in Dini Plaza, local law enforcement, i.e. the police department, sheriff's office, local office of the FBI, it was obvious to them that Oswald had killed, had killed Kennedy. And once they found out his background, this incredible kook, they formed the opinion, they felt very strongly about it, that he must have acted alone. So within probably 24 hours... This incredible kook, whiz kid of the CIA fake defector program, I wonder where they got that story from. Local law enforcement here was convinced That's that right. Oswald killed Kennedy and Apple. That's Apple. right. That's right. So at its core, this is a very simple case, and it remains a simple case. They got him to believe to this it. Very day. That's one reality. All There's these people reality. believe it. The other reality is because of the unceasing, fanatical uh, obsession of literally, and this is not an exaggeration, literally thousands upon thousands of Warren Commission critics and conspiracy theorists who've investigated every... Because there are that many anomalies to complain about. <laughs> Thousands of them. Every conceivable aspect of this case for close to 44 years and made hundreds upon hundreds of allegations. This simple case that has been transformed be into its present state. And what's its present state? I'll tell you what it is. Its present state is that this murder case is the most complex murder case by far in world history. Nothing even remotely comes close to it. And yet he said that it should have taken two days. <laughs> Just to give you an example, in manuscript form, one of my end notes, I'm not talking about the text now, I'm talking about an end note on acoustics. Oh, ran to about 120 long, pages with about 60 footnotes. 120 page end note. So we're talking about a case that at its core is simple, but it's no longer simple. 
With any project in life, uh, all of us, intuitively, we don't even have to give it a second thought. We know. Give us a truism. That if we work long and hard enough, Be we're going to reach the bottom of the pile. We don't even give it a second thought. But I'm here to tell you, and there are other people that know it as well as I do, there is no bottom to the pile in the Kennedy assassination. Right, right now as I'm talking to you, there's probably a hundred people out there open, in this right? country maybe working full-time, looking at some document from the National Archives for some inconsistency, discrepancy, contradiction, some little hint of a conspiracy. And that's bad. Probably a hundred people working full-time. Probably a thousand part-time. So Finding there's no stuff. bottom to the pile in the Kennedy assassination. And when you get thousands of intelligent people, I don't think they're too intelligent in this case, but otherwise intelligent people. What a cheap doctors, shot. Doctors, lawyers, leaders. Hasn't proven uh, a thing yet. Putting all of their Acting energy like he's and done attention something. and intelligence on a project like this, they can create a lot of mischief. Oh, mischief. And they've done Asking that. Asking questions. Uh, as you may or may not know, 75% of the American people, according to the last poll, believe in a conspiracy. Only 19% accept the findings of the Warren Commission. They're all stupid. Now, why is that? Well, in my opinion, the reason for that is that through their, their, their books and radio and TV talk shows and uh, movies, college lectures, etc. So the many anomalies. voice of the conspiracy theorists finally penetrated the consciousness of the American people. Yes. And succeeded in totally discrediting the Warren Commission. Yes. And convincing the vast majority of Americans that Oswald was either a part of some high-level conspiracy or just no. some patsy who was framed by yes. some exotic and elaborate group of conspirators ranging from yes. anti-Castro Cuban exiles yes. to uh, organized crime working in league yeah. with U.S. intelligence. Yeah. But it's all nonsense. It's all silliness. After the Snow movie came out, JFK, by the he way, he's so. not going to like me. Probably already <laughs> does not like me. Well, his movie is just one. By the way, quickly... The JFK video by Oliver Stone is about the most bettable hypothesis of what happened there is. And there's even more evidence to back up everything in it already. Now, there's a lot more he didn't know about. You know, there's a Pruder film being fixed and stuff like that. But everything else is just incredibly good stuff, pointing out incredibly good anomalies if you watch the film. It's brilliant, great, complete. I've been reading this stuff for many years, and uh, you can't beat JFK for a good historical background. Now, he wants to make fun of Oliver Stone? Hmm. <laughs> Before proving anything. Can, I'll say it publicly. It's one continuous lie. This oh, is... I should amend that. I should amend that. You got the date right. I, mean, I want to be fair. Oh, oh yeah, he wants to be fair. You got the location right. Oh, yeah, he wants to be fair. And you got the victim right. So I, I've got to yeah. be fair. <laughs> but other than that, it was one continuous lie. Shortly after no the proof yet, film, though, right? I was speaking to about 600 trial lawyers. Oh, uh, lots of lawyers. He's crazy. There were some questions asked about the Kennedy assassination, and I could tell by the rhetorical tone of the question that the, the questioner believed that there was a conspiracy. So I asked for a show of hands. How many of you folks believe in a conspiracy? In a fast, you know, number, just a forest of hands were elevated. It seemed like 90% of the audience. Okay. I said, what if I could convince you people, and you're all intelligent people, although some people may quarrel with that assessment about lawyers, but I said, what if I could convince you in less than one minute that you're not thinking very clearly about this case? You're not thinking intelligently about this case. In less than a minute, I said. Go. I said, I'd like to have another show of hands of people who either saw the JFK movie that had just come out, or at any time in the past <clears throat> read a book or a magazine article or a column propounding the conspiracy theory or otherwise rejecting the findings of the Warren Commission. Again, this vast forest of hands. It looked like the same number of people as, as before. I said, I don't need a show of hands for my second point. I said, I think you all agree that before you form an intelligent opinion, Upon a matter in dispute, you should hear both sides of the story. Like the old West Virginia mountaineer said, no matter how thin I make my pancakes, they always have two sides. Oh, ha, ha, ha. How many people haven't heard the Warren Commission side of the story? Ha, 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 He's making it sound like only the conspiracy theorists who are picking up the anomalies are getting their side of the story out, and the poor Warren Commission didn't get its side of the story out. What he should have done is he should have asked 
how many people believed the Warren Commission before they read any of the anomaly literature? 99.9% .9 of the hands would have gone up. And then he says, how many people now don't believe the Warren Commission? 90% of the hands go up the other way. Get the point? Everybody believed the Warren Commission until they found out it was a lie. Then they don't believe it no more. So you did hear the Warren Commission side of the story originally. He just forgot. <laughs> Makes it sound like only conspiracy theorists are out there, right? Warren Commission, nobody's reading it, taking it seriously. <laughs> so anyway, I said, with that thought in mind, how many of you have read the Warren Report? Oh, gee, they only read about the anomalies in the Warren Report, and they didn't read about LBJ's sister's housekeeper's cook. Oh, wow. How can they know anything when they only read the books about the anomalies, and they didn't read all the other 26 volumes of bull, <laughs> of paperwork, to, you know, an avalanche of paperwork, 26 volumes. Everybody should have read that before they come to an opinion. Well, we're going to see if you found anything in there to contradict the anomalies, right? It was embarrassing. That was it? That was his best point? Arranged. Was... They didn't read the Warren Commission's whole 26 volumes. Therefore, they had no right to feel that the Warren Commission anomalies were valid, is what he's saying, right? <laughs> his best point. Embarrassing. It I is. my point. It Someone's is done about 47 seconds. Oh, yeah. They what have formed point? an opinion rejecting the findings of the Warren Commission, and they hadn't read the Warren Report. And how can anybody who's only read about the anomalies possibly not be able to come up with an opinion without having read all the useless stuff, too? Yes, Vince. That's his best shot. <laughs> If I could condense the billions upon billions of words written on this case on the two main issues, that Oswald killed Kennedy and was there a conspiracy, let's see if I can do that in a couple minutes on each of these issues. Go. With respect to Oswald's guilt. Yes. For my career as a prosecutor, and I think this is just common sense, you don't have to be a prosecutor, if you're innocent of a crime, chances are there's not going to be any evidence at all Unless you're a patsy. <laughs> Pointing towards your guilt. Nothing at all. Why? Because you're innocent. Oh. But now and then, because of the nature of life and the unaccountability of things, now and then there may be a piece of evidence pointing towards your guilt, even though you're innocent, and in very unusual and rare cases, maybe even two things, maybe even three things. Geez, if you're a patsy, maybe 20 or 30. <laughs> pointing directly at your guilt, even though you're completely innocent. But in this case here, everything that Oswald did, everything he said, all the physical evidence, they don't all have the scientific any. evidence, everything points towards Oswald's guilt. Oh, really? In reclaiming history, I set forth 53 pieces of evidence pointing towards Oswald's guilt. And, and of course, it's not possible for the CIA and the FBI and the Secret Service and Naval Intelligence to plant 53 pieces of false information. Under those circumstances, <laughs> it would not be humanly possible. Let me reiterate that. Under those circumstances, with 53 pieces of evidence pointing towards guilt, it would not be humanly possible for Oswald to be innocent. At least not in the world in which we live. You know? Well... We haven't heard any evidence yet, have we? Just this number. <laughs> no, I'm talking to you folks. You can hear me. There's going to be a dawn tomorrow. Not in that world. Only in a fantasy world can you have 53 <sighs> pieces of evidence pointing towards your guilt. Well, give us one. And still be innocent. Let me just go over a couple of the pieces of evidence. With you. Yes. Ma Oswald's Mandelker Carcano rifle was the murder weapon. I mean... And the nitrate test showed he hadn't shot his rifle. So he didn't shoot his rifle, but it was his rifle. He must be guilty of shooting him. <laughs> Remember, no nitrate test, okay? No nitrates found. Come on, that's pretty strong evidence, right? No, it's not the anymore. It was Oswald's. 
It was his. He didn't shoot All him, but it was his. He's the only one that flees the building. Oh, favorite story out of the JFK was when they asked, he could have bought a rifle in any hardware store in Texas. Why would he go to a mail order store way up north? Unless it was to get on the record, right? That's a good point. After the shooting, there's a roll call. Where's Oswald? Is it Geez, I guess if Oswald's an FBI agent, he might be going out there trying to find his handler, right? The only one that took off. 45 minutes later, Oswald shoots and kills Officer J.D. Tippett. Tell us, please. Oh, and of course, there's no real evidence of that, is there? Lots of evidence he didn't. <laughs> Police Department, I told the jury in London that that murder bore the signature of a man in desperate flight from some awful deed. 30 minutes. Desperate flight. He sounded pretty cool, collected, though upset. This later, Oswald uh, resists arrest, pulls a gun on the arresting officer. Might have kept him alive. Sounds like they were going there to finish him off. During oh, his interrogation, gun he told one provable lie after another, all of which show a consciousness of guilt. Well, actually, we haven't heard any yet, so maybe he's going to back that up. One lie he told okay. showed a couple things. Number one, he was lying. Number two, he was pretty sharp. He said, I've never owned a rifle in my life. Interesting point, eh? So maybe he didn't order it when he could have gone and bought it. So they show him a photograph, the backyard photograph, holding the carcano. And he says, well, that's my head. It was superimposed on someone else's body. Pretty that's quick thinking. thinking. Pretty quick thinking? What if it's true? He's like this, leaning at an angle. You ever seen that before? What a weird picture, like this. They talk about the shadows, they talk about the chin, but if he denies it, I think I'd bet on him telling the truth before the prosecutor. When that people tell me that they think Oswald is innocent, and most of the major authors that write conspiracy books, they don't just talk about conspiracy, they talk about Oswald being innocent, and I got the quotes in the book. When they tell me that they think Oswald's innocent, I know one of two things. They're either completely unaware of the evidence, or they're just some silly person. Now, I want to read calling to you, is all he got. If there was one and only one contribution to the assassination debate I would want to make over and beyond the substance of this book. It's the obvious notion that once you prove the positive or negative of a, of a matter in dispute, all other... Well, you can prove a positive, but you can't prove a negative, okay? So, it shows the old guy's confusion, okay? He thinks he's proven some negatives here. <laughs> he's going to go on. <laughs> Their questions about the correctness of the conclusion become irrelevant. Yes. They only we have prove the positive, positive not the negative. The matter has not yet been proved. Put another way, the answers to all <clears throat> other questions dealing with the correctness of a conclusion are rendered moot and academic by the answer to the seminal question. Hence, once you truly prove the earth is round, all questions about whether it is flat become irrelevant. With respect to the Kennedy assassination, once you establish and know and we know, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond all doubt, that Oswald killed Kennedy. <laughs> so on the basis of our guilty finding, we can now know. Presume he's guilty. Therefore, you now know that everything else, all these inconsistencies, can't be true. Right? We know he's guilty. Therefore, these inconsistencies aren't inconsistent. Jeez. Once you Lawyer. establish and know that Oswald is guilty, as has been done, Once then you, you also necessarily, necessarily. We, the word we want to italicize, you also necessarily know that there is an answer, Paren, whether the answer is known or not. And, and whether he can come up with one or not. And whether he can even guess at a probable one or not. Or whether he even can guess at an improbable one or not. How did Oswald change the parade route? How did Oswald get the Secret Service to stand down? Did he call up Army Intelligence and say, we don't need you guys to come and provide protection here? How did Oswald do all that? Compatible with this conclusion, 
for the endless he did it? discrepancies Must have done it. and questions the conspiracy theorists have raised through the years about Oswald's guilt. This they simply do not understand. That if he if did it, did, in all probability, <laughs> their voice would finally, after more than 40 years, be silenced. If he did it, their yeah. Their inability or unwillingness to grasp this fundamental reality is if the he precise did it. reason why questions about Oswald's guilt will be broached by conspiracy theorists as long as chickens lay eggs. If he did it. If they don't have a satisfactory answer to if. any of their never-ending questions, Prim, yes, one if. among thousands, colon, something as obscure as whether it was Oswald or an imposter who allegedly signed Oswald's name to a guest register at a restaurant in North Dakota in 1963, Amprin, without thinking they automatically feel the question of Oswald's guilt is still unresolved. In other words, every... Well, that was a pretty irrelevant and unknown point to be so gung-ho about, right? I've never heard of him in North Dakota, did you? Oswald wasn't really in North Dakota. Jeez, I never knew that anyway. The event, incident, piece of information, inconsistency, and so on, is segregated and becomes the whole story in itself. Nothing is part of the whole. Each incident is its own whole. What the Warren Commission critics and conspiracy theorists seem incapable of seeing is that the answers to their countless questions are irrelevant. Oh, because he's guilty. His guilt has already been conclusively <laughs> established by other evidence. Now, if it hadn't, tell us, many, please. There are many unresolved questions would have to be addressed. And in a footnote, I give a couple examples. For instance, since we he sure makes a great case for Oswald's guilt if we presume him guilty, right? <laughs> Don't need any facts. We presume him guilty. Must be guilty. <laughs> uh, no lawyers. Oswald shot and killed Kennedy. We also know we that know questions it. such as. What is the small object resembling a bullet fragment that Dr. David Mantic has become obsessed with, believing it was planted in an autopsy x-ray to frame Oswald by indicating he shot from the rear? Whatever happened to the missing autopsy photos? Was Oswald a good shot or not? Why wasn't Commission Exhibit number 399 damaged more than it was? Whom did Roger Craig see running out of the book to pop? Okay, now Oswald did qualify as a sharpshooter, barely, the first time round. A few years later, he scored a 191, but in 1958, he didn't qualify. So how did he stay in the Marine Corps? Maybe learning Russian gave him a little bit of an edge, right? Sharpshooter. Repository building 15 minutes after the assassination and getting into a mass rambler. Did Oswald have time to get to 10th and Patton from his rooming house in time to kill Officer Tippett? Why doctors Gary Aguilar, Sirowak, and Rex Bradford want to know, did a test bullet fired through a test skull cause more damage to the right side of the skull than Commission Exhibit number 399 caused to the right side of Kennedy's skull? What is the reason for the sharp dent on the lip, lip of one of the three cartridge cases found on the floor of the sniper's nest? Are these not good questions? Josiah Thompson believes would have prevented it from being loaded with Oswald's rifle, and hundreds upon hundreds of other questions and problems the critics have with the case against Oswald. They're all... And do you think he answered them, or is he going to tell us he did? Irrelevant. Oh, that's Oswald. right. He did it, so they're all irrelevant. Lawyer thinking. <laughs> Presume he's guilty, so all these things are irrelevant. I, because we know, we know he's we know guilty. that Oswald killed Kennedy. So by definition, by definition, there has to be a satisfactory answer for all of these questions. And even if I can't come up with even one, <laughs> perceived discrepancies and problems with the case. So this is how a good prosecutor puts on a case when he's got no facts. <laughs> This is not an opinion I am giving. Oh, no! This is not an opinion I am Facts. giving. Facts! This is an incontrovertible, an incontrovertible fact of life oh. and logic. He did it! They would only have relevance if the guilt of Oswald hadn't already been established beyond all doubt. But it has. Oh, all doubt, all doubt. These anomalies don't count no more. I'm sorry I took up all that time, but I think it's pretty important because it deals with an issue. Well, yeah, you took up all that time telling us that we could presume because he's guilty none of these anomalies are important. So I guess he's not going to spend much time trying to answer the anomalies, will he? He's already presumed that if he's guilty, I'm going to win. Now, on the issue of conspiracy, oh. 
I say in the book that I'm satisfied beyond all doubt that Oswald killed Kennedy. I'm only satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that there was no conspiracy. I mean, I believe, I'd, I'd bet anything on it, that there was no conspiracy, but I think it would be a little unprofessional. I know, the fact that the House Assassinations Committee said there was, he still has doubt. <laughs> for me to say that I believe beyond all doubt there was no conspiracy. Why? Well, number one, Oswald is dead. Number two, it's a little more difficult to prove a negative than a positive. Oh, he knows! By the way, in a courtroom, you know, when you make an allegation, you've got the burden of proof. So the conspiracy theorists who say there's a conspiracy, they've got the burden of proof. I am the other side. Actually, no. The conspiracy theorists are the guys raising the anomalies in the government's conspiracy theory. Uh, he's got it backwards again. I Otherwise, no one's got to explain the anomalies. The conspiracy theorists have to figure out how it was done. Pointing the f out it's illogical is not enough. He's a lawyer, after all. It doesn't have to be convinced. And people like me, we don't have the burden like him, to prove yeah. a negative. But in the book, Reclaiming History, it does. Said for 32 reasons. Ah! all strongly indicating that there was no conspiracy in this case. So what I just... All right, 32 reasons explaining what was not. Now, if he had one reason, a good one, he wouldn't need 32, would he? Tread to you applies to conspiracy almost as much as it does to Oswald's guilt. Let's talk about conspiracy very briefly. Again, we're summarizing billions of words. There's no credible, credible evidence. I, note the word credible. Oswald did it, therefore any evidence that he didn't is not credible. True? He believes Oswald did it. All the proof says so. So any evidence is not credible. And note the word of the youth, credible. Very judiciously used. There's evidence, but he doesn't believe it that the CIA or mob or military industrial complex or any of these other groups were behind the assassination. Right, Oswald changed the parade route, <laughs> stood down Secret Service, stood down the Army, covered up the autopsy, you know, the Warren Commission. <laughs> Whizkid Oswald did all that. All we have is a naked assertion of this fact. Well, they also argue motive. The main reason why lay people believe that there's a conspiracy in the assassination and the main argument that conspiracy theorists use... Hey, not just lay people. People with science degrees too see anomalies in the physics and, and, and the math. Come on. To support their position of a conspiracy, that such and such a group had a motive. You know, uh, the military-industrial complex... Yeah murdered Kennedy because he was going to withdraw from, from Vietnam and they wanted to have a war, so yeah. they killed him. Yeah. The mob killed Kennedy because they wanted to get Bobby the yeah, they were there too. off yeah. their back. The CIA yeah. killed Kennedy. Their motive was that they, they thought yeah, Oswald, yeah. they, were there they too. thought uh, Kennedy was soft on communism, yeah, they so were they there killed too. him. Yeah. You know, when, 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 when a president of the United States is doing something that a particular group doesn't like, like, like uh, the military or Wall Street or the unions, or um, the military, I think I already mentioned the military, uh, environmentalists, they don't like what the president's doing, they send to kill them. I mean, that's what we routinely do in America. If they don't like what the president's doing, we kill them. Yeah, Abe Lincoln, <clears throat> McKinley. The, the reality is that motive doesn't mean that much. Oh. And yet, these conspiracy theorists devote entire books to establish a motive, and once they establish the motive, they think they're all the way home. The silly, ridiculous Oliver Stone finds ten groups with a motive to go Kennedy. He's got all ten involved. But one thing you know for sure is Castro and the Russians and Lee didn't have any motive. <laughs> but all the other guys did. He just named them all. No, really, yet ten groups involved in the assassination. And then you also hear people say, well, they have whole chapters, conspiracy book chapters. Not only motive, they say, but means and opportunity. Whoa, that's right. That's heavy. That's well, right. When I was a prosecutor, I mean, I was, I had heard the term, but I didn't know of any experienced prosecutors that, that use a term like that. It really doesn't mean much. I'll show you how little it means. He's coming to Dallas, right? The president, he said, we're coming into the nut country, because Dallas was extremely conservative back then. So there were a lot of people that hated Kennedy for his civil rights bills. 
So they had a Maybe they right? They hated yeah, him. And that's what we do when you hate the president, you kill him. Well, some what about did. Means? All they have to do is buy a rifle or a gun, right? What about yeah. opportunity? All they have to do is get here on Elm Street and they got motive, means, and opportunity. Yeah. But when you're in a courtroom, the real world, you know, I can hear a, a courtroom wag say, okay, 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 and motive, means, and opportunity. But did he do it? He had the means? Look, General Lansdale was there. He's the guy who stood down the army. Amory Roberts stood down the Secret Service guys who should have been on the car with Kennedy. You know what I mean? The Warren Commission, the aborted autopsy, give me a break. Did he do it? And all these people who point to his motive and they make this naked speculation. They don't have any credible evidence showing that any of these groups were behind the assassination. I told the jury in London. All right. So was there credible evidence that E. Howard Hunt was connected with Frank Sturgis and with David Ferry and even Oswald infiltrating their group and Clay Shaw and all these people that uh, Garrison said were connected with the assassination attempt? Jeez, I don't know. What about the Mafia? What about Ruby? What about Marcello? You know, I mean, uh, they all seem to play a part in it, too. Secret Service stand down, Army General stand down, Mafia participation, CIA participation. The only guy they didn't have was a Cuban with a cigar. Or maybe they did, they did but it wasn't a Castro White. So, give me a break. A, Do a Dallas jury. I said, I'll stipulate, I'll agree with you folks, that three people can keep a secret. I said, but only if two are dead. And keep that in mind. Here we're talking about now close to 44 years later, and not one single word, not one syllable that's credible is leaked out. I'm not talking about... That's credible. But let's skip that for a minute. Let's point out that on the eve of testifying, many witnesses were whacked. Okay? Now that's pretty startling in itself. Three days later, a guy who was going to... Maybe he knows something about Kennedy, gets whacked! Now... If you knew something about Kennedy, would you want anybody to know that you knew something about Kennedy when they whack people not only for talking, but for even getting called and maybe talking? Come on, give me a break. How can a lot of people hide such a big conspiracy? Well, if you get whacked, if you get called, you ain't going to want to let anybody know. Give me a break. Some guys say my father killed Kennedy and you find out the father's behind bars or someplace at the time. I'm talking about credible evidence. Not one word, not one syllable. Well, E. Howard Hunt's confession was pretty good, I thought, you know. Flaked out in close to 44 years showing that any of these groups were behind the assassination. I guess he just, missed that one. There's no evidence he's a lawyer, that right? Oswald was committing certain parts to any of these groups in any way whatsoever. And believe me, the FBI could not. That's right. He was seen at the CIA camps, anti-Castro. My God, there's just no evidence he was connected with these people. He was seen with David Fair. He was seen with Guy Bannister. No evidence he was connected. I've seen no evidence, said Vince, with his eyes closed. An extremely thorough investigation. I think it was Harold Weisberg, one of the, the great uh, assassination critics. I say great because Harold was an honest man. Wrote many books on the case, and I think it was Harold who Must said, you know, they yeah. checked out every breath that this guy ever breathed. From the moment he arrived back in the United States, from the Soviet Union, I think it was June 13, 1962, to the day of the assassination. That's right. Here's this defector who went and gave away all their U-2 secrets to the Russians at the height of the Cold War, coming back on a government-funded trip, and they weren't interested in watching him. Or they were now, he's saying. They got a big record on them. Look at Yeah, good point. Conducted 25,000 interviews. They found no evidence. Oh, oh, that Oswald found no evidence. With any of these groups. Oh, they really looked hard. You three. Know? Let's assume that one of these groups said, We want to kill the president. I reject it out of hand. It belongs in a Robert Ludlum novel. No, right. I say I reject it out of hand, not in my book. I devote a great number of pages to all these crazy theories. But I'm telling you. Name so calling is all he got say, so far. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, staff sitting around a conference table or wherever they are. It's, uh, wherever where, they want to go. With General Edward Lansdale, retreat, seen with the with three the heads of major corporations, the military-industrial complex, yeah, saying, yeah, let's yeah. murder President Kennedy. The Texas old boys. It's silly.
Oh, it's silly. Texas Oil Boys would never do Where that. Where was I? Gotta look at my notes. General Lansdale wouldn't do that. Secret Service Emory so Roberts no wouldn't stand evidence down. that any of these groups... No evidence. He's really looked hard. ...decided to kill Kennedy. But let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that one of these groups like the CIA said, let's murder President Kennedy. Make him look silly. Oswald obviously would be one of the last people on the face of this earth that they would go to to be... I know! Whiz kid, fake defector, last guy they'd go to! Get out of here. The hitman, I mean, come on! Pat's Why? baby. Well, number one, he wasn't an expert shot. He was a good shot. Okay. But he was not an expert shot. You're going to pull off the prime of the century. That's right. You want an expert shot. And that French number guy two, was the best in the world. Mail order rifle. Small trick. Number three, notoriously unreliable. Extremely yes. unstable. Here's a guy that defects. What a lousy the Soviet rifle. Union. Pre Gorbachev. I mean, even today, who in the world defects for the Soviet Union? Fake one of the Places on the face of the earth. That's right. And what does he do when he gets over there? He wants to become a citizen. They say no. He tries to commit suicide. Slashes his wrist. Fake just defector. A, pretty good. Type Stay of guy. Away. It worked. It's a CIA or mob. Was yes. It. This is the type CIA. of guy we want to rely on yes. to commit the biggest murder in American well, history. Well, to infiltrate Russia and get back. Yeah. <laughs> let's take it a step further. That one of these groups said, "Let's kill the president." All of them. For whatever crazy, strange, bizarre reason they want Oswald to be their hit man. Let's see if where that takes us makes any sense. After Oswald fled the, the book depository building, one of two things would have happened. Let me tell you the least likely thing first. The least likely thing is that there would have been a car waiting for him to help him escape down to Ecuador or wherever. That's the least likely scenario. They would, certainly wouldn't want their hitman to be apprehended and interrogated by the authorities. I know, he walked out the front door and took a bus. <laughs> Real upset. <laughs> but I think you know what I'm going to say. On the, the run! Move it, bus driver! <laughs> you have to know what I'm going to say already. If the mob or the CIA is behind Oswald, they're behind this whole thing, you have to know there would have been a car waiting for him somewhere around here, Elm and Houston, somewhere around That's here, why he took a bus. Waiting for him to drive <laughs> him to his death. You have to know that. Maybe that's why he took the bus. He's on the street, we know, with $13 in his pockets. Wow, right in front of me, better get out of here. Buses and cabs. No sensible person could possibly believe that the CIA or, or mob would permit something like that. You know, they, they missed him. They brought him right, right. right beneath right. the window. The motorcade route. That wasn't even determined until November 18th. Yeah, who changed the motorcade for the assassination. route? Assassination. It wasn't in the the, the uh, papers, as I recall, until the next day. Dallas Morning News, November 19th. Does any rational person actually believe that the CIA or what have you would conspire with Oswald to murder Kennedy three or four days before the president visited Dallas? That's just moonshine. Just because they changed the parade route to do a deke right in front of his building into the kill zone? That's just moonshine. It's crazy. <laughs> He's crazy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I think we're both, anyway, I think I'm laughing a little harder. I'm short-winded, but I want to uh, leave enough time here for questions and answers. Jeez, you haven't come up with any good yet. Before we open this up to questions and answers, because they were so important to the trial in London. And one is the, I, I assume most of you people here tonight are very familiar and read books on the assassination, so you all know about the head snap to the rear. Yeah. That head snap to the rear was first shown on national television, I think it was Geraldo Rivera's show, Good Night America, 1975, and millions of Americans saw Kennedy going down Elm, and all of a sudden his head going back eight inches. The inference being what? Well, that the shot must have come from the front. <laughs> the grassy knoll is, yeah. not from the rear, yeah. where Oswald was. Like his press secretary he said, you know. In London, Spence showed that segment of the Zapruder film five times. I didn't even object. He said it looked like Babe Ruth had struck the president from the front. He says, Mr. Bugliosi here is trying to convince you folks that what you saw with your very own eyes, you didn't really see. Here's the answer to that. Okay. If I hadn't had the answer, the verdict in London, almost assuredly, would have been not guilty. Tell us your answer. It would have been a reasonable doubt of guilt, but I did have an answer. What was the answer? And many of you probably already know it, and I have the photos in the book. 
You have to look at the individual frames of the Zapruder film. You cannot see it if you look at the film. You have to look at the individual frames. You look at frame 312, and I showed the jury in London on the screen. 312, the president's head's okay. At 313, one eighteenth of a second later, or 18.3 frames per second on the Zapruder film, the president is struck in the head. This is an explosion to the head. And in what direction is the president, president's head pushed at 313? slightly forward two point so that really makes a great argument that the part that they spliced out of the Zapruder film was a second shot to the head from the behind okay that did push him forward before that <laughs> pushed him back I mean is he gonna try and make us believe that we didn't see this just because he went this first I accept if there were two shots, he could have gone forward first before the big shot to the head to front. But to tell me that because his head moved forward for an eighteenth of a second before the big wham to the front with the press reporter pointing right there. Three inches. Not backwards, but forward. Indicating what? We all saw backward. Rear. So at the all-important moment of impact, the president's head was pushed forward, not backwards, indicating a shot from the rear. That was a key, key issue in London. That's why the big hole at the back. The case, <laughs> frames on, on a screen for the jury. I think the verdict would have been not guilty. I also showed the Dallas jury in London a high contrast photo of frame 313. It shows this terrible spray of blood and tissue. And yeah, they say that blob was put was there in the fixed the film, you know? indicating a shot from the rear. The magic bullet. Conspiracy theorists are so bold. Conspiracy theorists noticed that there were supposed to be only four grooves on a mark on one of the bullets from this rifle, and it originally had six. And when they found out they'd made a mistake, they had to switch it in the archives, okay? But they got pictures of both, four and six. Same bullet. <laughs> Trust the evidence. Quickly, other physical anomalies. The the most striking ones are, with the Zapruder film being tampered with, are the spectators who keep looking behind the limo. Okay, when it's coming around the corner, okay, when the first shots were supposed to be fired, you can see those spectators are still looking that way while the limo's over there, and nobody in their right mind wasn't going to turn and watch the limo go by. Now, in the next film, same thing. You can see that as Clint Hill, after the kill shot, he's running behind the limousine and grabbing on and being pulled off. You can see all the spectators looking over there still. They weren't watching the action. And you can see it every time. So, another weird anomaly. And, of course, the ladies who were taking the pictures who were in the road and said they were in the road, and the Zapruder film doesn't show that. And my, one of my favorites is as they're going by the last couple on the grass, all of a sudden, the guy's feet shoot apart. Okay, like in the space of a one frame to the other, suddenly they're wide open, okay? From an open stand, from a close to an open, or the other way, whatever. But it's neat to see it. Another neat anomaly is, as the limousine's going out there, you see JFK's foot hanging over the edge of the limo. How could his foot get there if he was propelled forward by a shot from the back towards his feet? Now, I would figure only a shot to the front that shoots you like this would lift your foot up in that direction to end up over the edge of the limo. But take a look at that. You can see his foot hanging over the edge of the limo, and if he'd been pushed forward, his foot couldn't have come up. You know what I mean? There's so many of these anomalies, you know, that aren't caught up, you know. And, of course, the major physical anomaly, I believe, is the fact that Clint Hill could not have caught up to a speeding away limousine. He's a human. And there were motorcycles going faster than he could have ever gone. So there had to have been frames when the car had stopped 
for him to be able to race up to the stop limousine to catch it as it started to go. And those were the frames that were cut out with the first kill shot or just, you know, I mean, that pushed him forward or whatever. Those were the frames that were taken out. And of course, there have been some great research done on what was moved around in the Zafruder film and where. So, hey, if they moved, if the people are looking there and they move the limo from there up to here, well, what are they covering over here with the limo that should have been over there? So, incredible. The Zapruder film is fixed, and that's why anything he wants to refer to the Zapruder film is simply part of the fix now, right? you got to go with the physical evidence. A guy can't outrun a car that's speeding away, you know, and people can't spread their feet in an instant, and the driver couldn't have turned his head back and front in the eighteenth of a second or whatever it took him. Physically impossible. Those kind of physics anomalies always bothered me. Don't seem to bother Vince, though. Oh, I bet you didn't mention him in his book. So outrageous. Outrageous! And not only do they lie I didn't about lie. things where there's documentary evidence controverting what they're saying, they go beyond that. They literally lie when what? there's photographic evidence, film evidence. Wow, film evidence! They're lying. They the Zapruder film! Because their audience, maybe only one out of a hundred, know, know the truth. And what they do in their sketches, and I've got the sketch in the book, they place Governor Connolly seated directly in front of Kennedy in their ah. sketches. And it was in the Oliver Stone movies. One of the weaker arguments, in front, sure. And they argue that a bullet coming from the book depository building, 6-4 window, right to left, passing through soft tissue on a straight line, to hit Connolly, they say, would have to make a right turn in midair and then a left turn to hit Connolly. That's why the smart conspiracy theorists don't say that happened. The smart conspiracy theorists point out the doctor said there was an entry wound in his throat. And then after that, there was a little slit of a tracheostomy to put in an air pipe. But no big gash coming out. Okay? So, uh, and, of course, Governor Connolly reacted a second and a second and a half after the bullet, they say, came out of Kennedy's throat. So... It's not that we don't believe the trajectory was wrong. It's not that we believe the trajectory was wrong. It's that we believe that the timing was wrong. Governor Connolly shouldn't have been able to be holding up his hat with a busted arm at that point. And yet there he is. You can see it. JFK's like this around the throat, been shot in the throat. And here's Connolly waving his hat still, turning around. And they're trying to tell us it's the same bullet because he could have been in a trajectory? This is his argument? Ha 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 ha! Take a physics course, loser. Oh, lawyers were never good at math, so they didn't take physics, you can bet. Bullets don't do that, it's a magic bullet. The single bullet theory is dead. That's what they argue. No, it doesn't slow down for a second and a half. Is that uh, if you start out with an erroneous premise, oh, what's everything that? that follows makes a heck of a lot of sense. But the problem is that's all wrong. What is it? Connolly was not seated directly in front of Kennedy. I think most of you folks know that. He was seated to the left. And that's what slowed down the bullet for a second and a half. He was seated to the left. It came out of him, waited a second and a half, and it didn't have to move. Okay, that's why. See, that's what you call a weak sister argument. Okay? Point out that the trajectories could still align, and they say they don't. Hey, we're not talking trajectories. We're talking timing front of President Kennedy, in a jump seat, a half a foot in. I got photographs, I got one very good photograph in the book, and this is where the film shows it. It could have been. So they flat out lie knowing, the people that do this, write these sketches, they know that Conley was not seated directly in front of Kennedy. And still they put him that way. Why? So they can argue the matter. They should have put a timeline, you know. Kennedy hit here, Connolly hit here. Can't be saying bullet. Oh, they already did. <laughs> he just never saw it yet. And I guess Spence didn't prov provide it in defense. Magic bullet. In London. Okay! Spence had Dr. Cyril Weck on the stand. You probably know Cyril. He's a former, may a former um, coroner of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. Yeah. So he asked 
a so real coroner. Dr. Weck characterized for this jury this, this bullet. And of course, Weck said, well, it was like a magic bullet that doesn't even exist in cartoons. Make it. Well, that's because after it hits so many bones and things and leaves fragments behind in Connolly's leg and his wrist and in Kennedy's brain, that there should be some fragments missing from the bullet. So when you get a bullet and there's no fragments missing and you got victims with fragments in them, you got to wonder, could the victim bullet with nothing gone be the bullet that lost everything in the victims? Maybe not. <laughs> right and left turns in midair. Across the back on trajectory. Dr. Weck, now. Dr. Weck, if this bullet which is passing on a straight line through soft tissue in Kennedy's body... Oh, by the way, it would have hit the neck bone. That. That's a lie. I said, if it did not go on to hit Connolly, which you say it did not, why didn't it tear up the interior of the limousine or hit the driver? He says, I don't know. I didn't conduct the investigation in this It was case. a front shot. That's why. <laughs> it looks like you folks are the ones that have a magic bullet here. If it didn't go on to hit Connolly or tear up the interior of the limousine or hit the driver, I said, it must have zigzagged to the left. He said, no, it need not have zigzagged to the left. I said, did it hop, skip, and jump over the car? He said, no, it need not have... No, it waited it a second and a half. Dr. Weck, tell this Dallas jury, what happened to that bullet? His answer was, I don't know. It stopped a second and a half. So who's got the magic know. bullet here? Still you. <laughs> For over 40 years... Nobody noticed a second and a half. ...wrapped that magic bullet around the Warren Commission's neck, and the majority of Americans think the Warren Commission had a magic bullet. But Come the only on. people that had a magic bullet here are the conspiracy theorists. Because if we believe them... Once that bullet exited the president's throat, it looked... And it left some of its metal behind. And once it exited Connolly's wrist and left some of that metal behind. And once it landed in his knee and left that metal behind, there should have been some metal gone, right? <laughs> I love that one. Really vanished into thin air without a trace. So no, on, the magic bullet. They, they found the pieces still. It's still in Connolly's knee. After over 40 years of the most prodigiously intensive investigation and examination of a murder in world history. Oh, yes, he examined it very closely with his eyes closed. Exists, which cannot be challenged. Oh, yeah. I bet. Number one, not one weapon other than Oswald's manager Carcano was ever found and linked to the assassination. Not one. And Oswald wasn't linked to that. <laughs> Uh, no weapon other than Oswald's manager Carcano. Not one bullet. It was his b rifle. Other than the three he didn't shoot Oswald's it, but it was his rifle. Was ever found and linked to the assassination. Yeah. No person other than Oswald has ever been connected by any credible evidence. Oh, by the way, the credible evidence was the, you know, the, the little receipt for the thing from the mail order house, right? <laughs> That's his only credible evidence that Oswald was stupid enough to get mail order when he could have got one without with complete anonymity. Whiz kid wasn't so whiz suddenly, right? Assassination. Only Oswald. Oh. This is close to 44 years now. Thousands of investigators, they come up just empty-handed. I don't think no so. No evidence has ever surfaced, as I indicated before. That's right, I don't see any evidence surfaced at all. Believed to be behind the assassination. And no evidence has ever been found showing no that evidence. any person or group murdered Oswald and framed, or murdered President Kennedy and framed Oswald for the... I know, Ruby just wanted to keep visiting the police station for all those opportunities to shoot him. ...murder that they committed. Now one would think that faced with these stubborn... Quickly, Ruby was connected! Ruby worked, was an FBI informant. It was connected with the anti-Castro people. He worked for Richard Nixon's office at some point when he was a congressman or something. So, and connected to the mafia, and so very connected. Okay, much bigger person than they ever gave him credit for. And the mutable realities that the conspiracy theorists, unable to pay the piper, would fold their tent and go home. I bet. But instead, undaunted and unfazed, they continue to disgorge even more of what they've given us for the last close to 40 years. That's right. Oswald couldn't have changed the parade route. Stood down Secret Service.
called down the army, right? Keep telling us. Oops, Mr. oops, Wild oops. speculation. Left all the windows open. Oops. The facts. Okay, I went longer than I should have. I, I have a Don't want to go anymore. That's Vincent Bugliosi's case against Lee Harvey Oswald. He thinks that's satisfactory. Cool. Not too, 20 years ago, someone wanted me to write on an important subject and say, Vince, we're going to give you 3,500 words. I said, I can't say hello in 3,500 words. <laughs> it ended up 7,500 they published the whole thing. I'm sorry it took as much time as I did, but let's open this up to questions and answers. I know there's some real strong, really strong conspiracy theorists out there. You're going to ready to hit me with some, some tough questions. Yes, sir. I'd like to know, uh, above and beyond uh, Lee Harvey Oswald being the lone assassin, on the sixth floor, there was a photograph of the grassy knoll, the wooden fence, and some trees with an alleged person behind the trees. Did any of your research ever get into that area? Well, yeah, the whole grassy knoll area I get into in considerable depth, and the uh, photographic panel, the House Select Committee on Assassination, they enhanced that whole area there, and they saw nothing at all. Yet, conspiracy theorists see all types of people there with, with rifles. <laughs> Actually, I like the conspiracy theorists who saw the puffs of smoke and all the people running up the glassy knoll to where the shots came from with the puffs of smoke. But if he wants to say that, gee, there's no pictures of who did the puffs of smoke, fine, but there were puffs of smoke. No one else can see it. I think there were 14... Uh Photographic experts on that. Oh, but then all those witnesses weren't called by the Warren Commission, the ones who saw the puff of smoke. So if nobody saw a puff of smoke, I guess there wasn't a puff of smoke. House Select Committee. It may have even been 21. I forget some of the facts. But anyway, oh, at 21 least 14 experts. photographic experts oh, from so many. top institutions throughout the country, uh, they tried to make that area as clear and enhance it as much as possible. They saw absolutely nothing. And that's in the House Select Committee report. Did they see the, the smoke? Grassy Knoll, when you stop to think about it, now that we're talking about it, how much sense does it make? If you're firing from the grass, you know that's the president's right, okay? His right front. If you're firing from the right, there's got to be some entrance wounds, if the bullets are coming from the right, to the right side of the president's body. There were no entrance wounds, according to the Warren <laughs> Commission, House Select Committee. Kennedy's no press secretary? To the right side of the president's body. Only two bullet entrance wounds, and Dr. Wecht himself agrees, both to the back side of the president. Oh. One on the upper right back, exit to the front of the throat, and then there was one bullet that entered the upper. I've heard Dr. Wecht talk about a shot to the front, okay? So that's bull, if he's trying to say that Dr. Weck didn't say there was a shot from the front. My God. I mean, it was Dr. Weck who first exposed the, you know, the little hole in the throat in those original videos. Wow. Talk about outright lying. The right part of his head and exited the right front of his head. <laughs> and yet everybody kept doing this and this. Hole back here, big one. Shot there. <laughs> He's got it backwards. Maybe he watched it backwards, but no, their hand would be in the wrong place. <laughs> didn't he see all those people do this? Big hole back here. Jeez, I guess he didn't. Oh, they weren't called those doctors, first doctors who saw the body. That's right. Nobody saw. But both entrance wounds are to the president's back. So if the shots came from the grass, you know, by definition, you would have had entrance wounds to the right side of the president's body. There weren't any. Furthermore, the shot at frame 313 from the so-called picket fence, it's about 35 yards, very, very close. A bullet traveling 2,000 feet a second, weighs a third of an ounce. Oh, interesting point. The Manlicker Carcano rifle cannot fire high-velocity rifles. I mean bullets. It's a low-velocity rifle, so it couldn't have even fired the high-velocity projectiles that hit the president. Isn't that cute to find out? Check that one out. Oswald's rifle couldn't have fired the bullets. <laughs> oh, neato. That bullet, most likely, is going to pass right through the president's 
head or body. No, they actually showed that it couldn't go in there without striking major bones in, in, the, uh, in the spine, and therefore that can't be true. Isn't it? At an absolute minimum, isn't it going to go over to the left side of his body? A third of an ounce traveling at 2,000 feet a second? The head wound, the autopsy surgeon said the left hemisphere, the president's head of brain, was, quote, intact, unquote. If a bullet came from the grassy you knoll, obviously there would have been an injury to the left side of his body. Most likely exit wounds. There was nothing at all. Well, it depends. You get hit here, okay, and it comes out back there. That's a reasonable hit, right? Right through the right, he right side of the head? No one saw anyone with a weapon. We did see Jackie going out towards the back to pick up the piece of his head. <laughs> Jeez, I guess she went in the wrong direction if it went the other way. <laughs> the rifle on the grass, you know, no weapon, no expended cartridges from, from a weapon were found there. It didn't happen. Just, oh, they picked up their shells if there were three guys there, so it didn't happen. We didn't find anything. <laughs> not to think about it, it really doesn't even make that much sense. You say so. Because with all eyes going to the front, or most of the eyes going to the front in the presidential motor gate, if you're a sniper, forget about Oswald for a moment. Whoever killed Kennedy was a sniper. Headlines, New York Times, next day, Kennedy killed by sniper. Not one of these fellows like uh, Hinckley who tried to kill uh, President Reagan in front of everyone. It was a sniper. If you're a sniper and you want to get away, are you going to position yourself to the front where you're within the range of vision of most of the people driving? Well, it depends if you're part of a team, right? And didn't we have that old guy, the mute, who uh, actually testified that he saw the guy do the handoff of the gun, the rifle? <laughs> I guess he's not going to play him. Down the street? I don't think so. You're going to do what Oswald did. Most of the eyes are looking forward, and he picks the president off from the back. And if you go up to that window, I'm sure most of you have been there, and you imagine holding a rifle. Yeah, if I imagined holding a rifle, I'd want to shoot him as he was coming up Elm Street, you know, or Houston Street, and slowing down, right? You don't want to have to shoot him as he's going faster away. This would have been the easy shot without any trees blocking. So why didn't he take the easy shots with the limo that was going to have to slow down to make this huge turn? And why wait until after the limo was on its way to speeding up? Hell of a, a sniper, eh, this whiz kid? <laughs> that barrel is virtually on a straight line with Elm Street. Also, the limousine is only traveling 11 and a half miles an hour. There's a 3.9 degree declination to Elm Street. The relevance of that is that it eliminates the necessity of elevating the muzzle as the limousine gets farther away from the sixth floor window. I asked my firearms guy from Wisconsin in London, I said, I don't want to As if having to do mouth. this he isn't going to shake up your stationary your target. He said, yes, the president essentially was a stationary target. The grassy no actually would have been a more difficult shot. Why? Because the limousine is passing from left to right. It's a moving target. But if you go up to the window, as the limousine was going in the southwesterly direction, it's almost a, a straight shot. But not as straight as coming right down the front. Why? They say, you know, no one's ever duplicated what Oswald did. It's just not true. Absolutely not true. During the Warren Commission period, a uh, specialist Miller in the Army duplicated what Oswald did. It's just I went and did a search for Specialist Miller trying to duplicate the Oswald feet. Didn't find it anywhere on the net. CBS in 1967 had a firearm specialist beat what Oswald did. Didn't find that either. My firearms guy in London beat what Oswald did. So they what are they saying Oswald did? Oh, it's going to come up later. They say he did it in eight seconds instead of six. And that's why their guys could do it in eight. Just tell these lies. They also say Oswald could hit the broadside of a barn. Some of them say it. That's another lie. He's a sharpshooter. He fired a 212. And in 58, he didn't qualify at all. <laughs> in the military. Not an expert, but he's a sharpshooter. And then the others go the other way and say 
no one could do what he did, could fire three shots, and they say in only 5.6 seconds. Well, it's more than 5.6 seconds. First shot at 160, that's what most people believe. Third shot at 313, it's 8.4 seconds. And when you stop to think about it, the clock only starts to run from the first shot. Because the first shot, the cartridge is already in the chamber, they've already aimed, he's already aimed, forget about Oswald, whoever it was. So he's got 8.4 seconds to fire two shots. Now it gets a little more sophisticated than that. I'm just telling you that the conspiracy theorists have not been truthful with the American public. And how great a shot was it? I don't think it was a great shot. Why did he have to be a great shot? Jesus. You gotta be a great shot. Moving target? Come on, I've been on a firing range. I know how hard it is. Give me a break. Range is... If Jesse Ventura couldn't do it, I don't think Lee Harvey Oswald could have done it. 100, 200, 300, and 500 yards. And a lousy scope as well? Loose? The first shot hit the president with 59 yards. I think that the, uh, the shot to the head was 88 yards. Actually, they never talk about the shot to the back. Oh, that's right. That's supposed to be the shot that they say go through the neck. But then Gerald Ford admitted that the shot that was four or five inches down the back, he'd had them change it to up to the neck so that it could, the nape of the neck, so that they could then argue that it came out of his neck to hit Connolly. But the shot actually hit five inches down below if you go look for proof. So how come they never talk about that, right? Here's a shot that hardly penetrated, they said, and he's trying to say it's the one that went through and it exited in Kennedy's neck. Ah, oh, give me a break, Vince. Lower than what is the measurement when you fire for record in the military. So it's 59 yards, 88 yards. We assume that Oswald's aiming at the head. Why? He's trying to kill him. That's the most vulnerable part of his body. First shot misses completely. Second shot, again, misses the target. Hits the upper right back. The third shot hits the head. One out of three. Upper right back. Talking about Oliver Stone, how silly this person is. Now, did it never dawn on him that if a bullet hit the upper right back going down, there's hardly any way it's going to end up coming up to come out the throat? In his movie... He says, and I'm not, I'm not making this up. You can't make up stuff like well, this. Well, we sisters is going to be. How do you make up stuff like this? Oh, yeah, yeah. In his movie, he says there were three professional gunmen. I don't know where they came from, but around the world. They were the best shots in the world, according to Oliver. Three professional gunmen fired six shots at Kennedy. Well, let's count them. You got the one that hit him in the back. You got the one that hit him in the throat. You got the one that hit him in the head from the front. And possibly another one that hit him in the head from the back. Okay? So there's three in one. Now, Connolly. Now, you can believe that that was the magic bullet. Or you can believe he got his own shot. And maybe even a second shot for the leg. One and one. So, and then finally, the missed shots. Now, you saw the shot that James tagged. They had to admit he got hit by a piece of cement from the hit. And there was the uh, manhole cover bullet in the grass they're looking for. And there's the bullet in the uh, limousine right at the top there over the mirror. There's three. So, we're talking possibly five unknown shots. Three misses. Um, Kennedy, three for sure. And Connolly, one or two. Well, that's a lot of shots. How can you possibly believe three? Just count the wounds. Now, we assume that these professional gunmen are aiming at the head. They're trying to kill Kennedy, right? Oh, there were some misses. But, I heard, don't forget, they had painted these little two-foot yellow flashes on the road where the limo was going by so they could better coordinate the hit. Okay, they could time things perfectly, and it seems that Greer, the driver, made too far of a turn. And that's why there was a bit of a jostling for him to get back into position in the right place. So, that went on. And Oliver says it was a turkey shoot, meaning it was so easy. 
In other words, the well, we just heard that Plan B A didn't work, okay? Because for some reason Greer was off the place, and he got back into the right area by maybe the next spot, Plan B. So they're saying, oh, geez, you didn't shoot him in Plan A. Well, the guy was not in the right place, was he? The president was just a sitting duck. And in my book, I say, Oliver, did you bother to read the manuscript, or whatever you call it, the script of your own movie? Did you bother to read the script, Oliver? Come on. Let me tell you what Oliver Stone says, how, how he says how well these three gunmen did. Again, I'm quoting Stone now. Oh, Is it Who cares how well they did? Greer wasn't in the right place the first time. Three top gunmen, right? It's a turkey shoot, right? Close range. Almost a stationary target. According no, to not stationary. The first well, shot. Yeah, it was actually. It's missed the limousine entirely. So this, this high But that's when they hit him twice. But it stopped. Whoever hired. Not only couldn't hit Kennedy, couldn't even hit the presidential limousine. According Jeez. to Oliver Stone. Jeez. Two we shots to the script. head. Apparently. No, Oliver Stone didn't know the Zapruder film was fixed. Cheap shot. I don't think there's anything wrong with him, is there? I mean, some people... No, I don't think there's anything wrong with Oliver. I think he's pretty bright. Oh, go away. Second shot... You're not. Him, ...according to Oliver in the throat. That's not good enough, Oliver. They're there to kill him. The throat shot wouldn't... In fact, you know, Parkman doctor said the bullet that entered the upper right back and exited the throat, they felt the president would have survived that and had been the head shot. <laughs> so right. Oliver... That exited the right back and exited the throat. <laughs> Think about that. It entered the right back going down and it exited the throat. And this lawyer doesn't see the inconsistency of that. <laughs> I can't give you credit for the second shot. It did not hit the target, it hit the throat. Third shot, according to Stone, hits the upper right back. Again, Oliver, your professional gunman, expert, upper top right. gunman hired by the CIA, missed the target. Fourth shot, Oh, so because they missed some shots, that means they can't have been shooting. Lawyer thinking. <laughs> Not only doesn't hit Kennedy's head, doesn't hit his body, misses his body, misses his body completely. That's right. And hits Governor Connolly. Okay. The yeah. fifth shot, according to Oliver Stone. Even they aimed at him. Misses the limousine again completely. I mean, did, did these guys earn their money or their weight? Ah uh, ha ha ha, they weren't very good shots. And they should have been great shots if the conspiracy theorists are wrong. So since there were so many misses, it must have been Oswald. <laughs> I don't think so. The sixth shot hits the president in the head. That's one out of six, Oliver? It's embarrassing. I think That's it's embarrassing. embarrassing. I'm embarrassed for you, Oliver. <laughs> I'm pretty embarrassed for him too, you know, when Oliver did such a great job with the information he had to have this donkey try and disparage it on TV like this. No, I am. I really am. He have really you ever had is. on stage and they're making a fool out of themselves and you kind of turn away, you know. You're... Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess we're getting our chance right now, eh? I'm turning away. You're making too much of a fool of yourself. Because you don't want to see the embarrassment. I'm I know. Embarrassed for Oliver I know. I'm embarrassed for you too. And I think that Oliver, when he goes to these cocktail parties, reclaiming history, West LA is going to be looking at people. So I wonder if they read reclaiming history. I hope so. You know, it's going to avert their glance. It's yeah. embarrassing what this guy did. And Oliver, what do you think? You think he's pretty convincing so far, <laughs> Mister Half Truth? He's not going to like me. Yeah, I don't like you. Yes, sir. You're a crook. An okay, thank you, Mr. Bugliosi. I enjoyed your presentation. Thanks for coming tonight, and I'm looking forward to read your book. Thank you. Just a general question about your book and your research in the last 20 years. Who was the most interesting person you interviewed for this book? The most interesting person I interviewed for this book? I'd have to say Marina. Um, a very close friend of mine Jack Duffy's here tonight, leans towards a conspiracy theory, but he's saying now, he's reading my book, I, I always told him, I said, Jack, I hope my book at least convinces you, my friend, that there's no conspiracy. I hope Jack's anyway, not that dumb. Uh, I wanted to interview Marina, not because I could learn anything from her. She had been interviewed, That's you know, right. hundreds of times.
hundreds of times. Nothing to be learned. Uh, so she really had nothing new to tell me. I knew, but uh, he knew that. Uh, yes. Derivatively, she's a historical. That's right, but he knew already. She had nothing important to say. Let's see if he keeps that opinion. Bigger. So Jack did a great job and uh, located Marina. She was working at an Army surplus store here in Dallas. I think it was November of 2000, wasn't it, Jack? Anyway, we walk in and Jack says, Marina, this is Vincent Bugliosi. I know who he is. I've seen him on TV. And I said, well, yeah, Marina appeared a couple times. He said, are you proud of it? <laughs> I won't say it went downhill from there, but it didn't get too much better either. Good. You deserve it. And I spoke to her for about 45 minutes, not really about the facts of the case. No, no, I'm not you know, interested in I the facts. I knew that her mind had been so impregnated with all these crazy conspiracies. Ah, the woman who originally thought that Lee was guilty, like the other 99% of the people who believe the Warren report, now doesn't believe anymore. She's been infected by these conspiracy theories like the other 80% of Americans. Can't have anything important to offer. Theories that uh, whatever she told me was not a value. But ah, there it is. She now believes conspiracy theories, so whatever she had to tell him was of no value. Ha! <laughs> Didn't make his book. The most comprehensive book there is, but what Marina had to tell him wasn't important enough. <laughs> For years, as you well know, she said that her husband killed the president. And now she doesn't! Wow! And he wasn't interested in why. <laughs> But uh, some factual matters came about, and Jack said, Marina, did you take the backyard photos? And she said, yes, I did. That's and weird, because Lee that says that no. Question. You're aware, Jack, that she had already testified to that, that she took the backyard photos. I always have follow-up questions, and uh, I try to get in touch with her again, and when I called back, the fellow that answered the phone, he said, I'm not going to be able to get her to talk to you. And I said, well, why? He says, well, for some, some reason, I've never seen Marina intimidated by anyone else in my life, except by you. So he's the only guy who brought up when she was forced to lie, probably. No, I'm not an intimidated. Would you want to get on stage and repeat the lie again when you don't believe it anymore? In person at all. Nothing intimidating. You've seen me. Is there anything intimidating about me? No, obviously not. And did she act intimidated when I walked through the door? I know who you are, you know. So I don't know, I don't know what the story is here. The only thing I can think of is she probably knew I did my homework and I was prepared. And maybe that's why she found me intimidated. But I'm not an... And again, I'm going to say, if she lied about that picture and he wants to focus on it, does she really want to come back and repeat the lie? intimidating person at all, but so I never spoke to her again. And she won't give him what he needs, the repetition of what might have been her biggest lie. Good girl. Now the night before the assassination, he goes out, it was a Thursday night, and he'd never gone out on a Thursday night before. He used to go out with Buell Frazier Friday evening, come back Monday morning. But this time he goes out on a Thursday evening to get his rifle at Ruth Payne's garage. Oh, by the way, the package, they say he carried it and wasn't long enough to have a rifle in it. <laughs> in Irving. Why? Well, obviously he intended to kill the president. But here's my position. I may be wrong. I think it was conditional. Oh. Yes, he intended to kill the president, but it was conditional if Marina would not take him back. Oh, well, yeah. And Marina King. has oh, testified yeah. that that night what a piece of he boy. begged her begging her three times to come back to him. I... Whiz kids going to try and prevent the assassination of the president the next day and they're trying to make it sound like he's going to decide to kill the president if she says no. This is his story. Oh, Lord. And get you that used washing machine that you want. He's oh. making dollar twenty-five working here in the building. That's right. Where do you get the, the money for a Minox camera? Lot, right? Eight dollars a week. Living in the clock. Think about that. Wizkid had a Minox spy camera found with. My belief, without knowing, 
is that uh, if she had come back to him, he wouldn't have, he killed would not the have shot the president the following day. I mean, oh. I just find it very, very hard to believe yes. that he would have done that. Yes. Marina herself says that. She wrote a letter to the uh, Warren Commission in Russian that was translated into English. She takes on the responsibility for the murder. She said, if I had any idea what he was going to do the My next God, day, I would have taken them back. I would have got back to him. So I think there's some, some connection. I can't be 100% sure. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm 99% sure. If she's, 99, if she's he's a lawyer, to yeah. Fire, use washing machine and get an apartment. I don't think he's a hit man, the CIA. If you're the hitman for the CIA or the mob, the night before the assassination, you're telling your wife you're going to get her a used, what did I say, a used washing machine. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't. He's right. And uh, thank you very much for coming here tonight, and I, I wish all of you the very best of luck in all the years ahead. Thank you very much. For How depressing. Oh, yeah, a few more points you didn't mention. I just want to rattle off right now. You gotta ask yourself, there's so much evidence of Lee Harvey being framed. Why would they frame an innocent man? His rifle was used, but he hadn't shot it. <laughs> um, Tippett came by his room and house while he was here and tooted twice, the landlady said. Well, that's a weird connection, right? Oh, and as for the parade and stuff like that, Someone changed the order of the cars and put the limo first, okay, Rather, and canceled the reporter's truck that would have been in front. And the aide was moved out of the center seat where he should have been into a back car. So, pretty neat stuff that Oswald pulled off, eh? Quite the whiz kid. And he turned off all the phones in Washington, D.C., at noon that day, uh, that was mentioned in the JFK movie, but wow, how'd he do that? You know, all the phones in Washington, D.C., Oswald did it. So, those are just some more of the anomalies that I want to deal with. I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that. So that's my defense of Oswald. I did not go into who ordered it and who coordinated it, short of mentioning General Lansdale and Amory Roberts with the Secret Service. But Lyndon Johnson had to be involved. Alan Dulles in the Warren Commission. Gerald Ford had to be involved. You know, these are the kind of people with incredible power who were really mad at John F. Kennedy and uh, had the power to do what happened. And Lee Harvey and the Russians and Castro did not. So... On that note, I'm going to say that uh, JFK was one of the saddest events in history. I thoroughly appreciate Oliver Stone's efforts, and I really appreciate the recent efforts of John Costella and uh, Professor Mantic in taking apart the Zapruder film and proving that it is a hoax. You know, lampposts in the wrong place and people's sizes in the wrong place and pictures being moved in the wrong place all to perpetrate the hoax that Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president alone when there's a good chance he was trying to save him for a second time. I really think that Harvey was a hero second time too. Johnny Engineer signing off for uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, the hero.